Hi, friends. It is Michelle. Instead of a sponsor for the podcast today, we wanted to extend an invitation for you to sow seeds into the Salt Sisters Mother House campaign. The Salt Sisters, Sister Miriam's order, are building a mother house in Corpus Christi, Texas. And why are they building a mother house in Corpus Christi, Texas? They are doing this so they can help care for their aging sisters, but also so they can better serve their community locally and abroad. The mission of the Salt Sisters is to be the light of Christ in areas of the deepest apostolic need. They serve in so many different capacities, including education, evangelization, pastoral care, retreats, health care, and drug rehabilitation. And they are about 73% on their way to their fundraising goal. So if you feel called to donate to the Mother House campaign, you can visit salt, S-O-L-T dot net backslash Mother House, but we'll also provide the link below. And there you can learn more about the campaign, donate, make a pledge, or just share the word about the mission of the beautiful Salt Sisters. If you want to help the Salt Sisters, but feel like you're not able to do so financially right now, will you just join us right now in saying a prayer for their campaign? pain. God bless you, friends, and I hope you enjoy this next podcast episode. Well, hello, dear friends, and welcome to season 12 of the Abiding Together podcast. We are so excited to be back with you for another season. Abiding Together is a place where you can find connection, rest, and encouragement on your journey with Jesus Christ. And we have people from all over the world on this walk together, and you are most, most welcome. My name is Sister Miriam James, and every week I'm joined by two of my very dearest friends, Michelle Benzinger and Heather Kim, and we speak about what the Lord is doing in our life, the movements of the Holy Spirit, what is breaking our hearts, what is healing us, and where the Lord is leading us to deeper relationship with Him. So wherever you find yourself today, wherever that is, you are most welcome. So grab a cup of coffee, settle in, and welcome home. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Abiding Together podcast, our first ever summer series on the apostolic exhortation by St. John Paul II of uh, Christi Fidel's Laici. And this is our third week. So if you are have been on the journey with us, you are most welcome to continue. If not, please jump in. This is a great document about a lot of really wonderful things. And this week we're going to talk about part three, which is I have appointed you to go forth and bear fruit. But before we do so, Michelle Benzinger, it's it's very hot where you are and we have to talk about the weather because we're old ladies so how are we how are we doing y'all it's just nasty it is like when you walk, i mean it is so humid and gross like when you walk out you feel like you're walking into a hair dryer mm. you know it's just nasty so we got that nice dog days of summer already and it's just mm-hmm. yeah and so like i have to get up so early just so i can get outside before i just sweat in a puddle of ew in mm-hmm. nastiness. So yeah. Mm. Doesn't that sound lovely, friends? Doesn't it sound so good? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's time to go visit Heather. Yeah. 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 I was like, I totally get snowbirds now. <laughs> Heather, it's time to come visit you in the Pacific Northwest. So yeah, because uh, Heather, you sent us a picture the other day of you on a little pool float. It wasn't Carl, it wasn't a unicorn, but it was a pool float with, it was, uh, with your doggy. Yes. Our unicorn leaks. It's, uh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of leaking going on up here in regards to the pool. But yeah, our little dog Charlie just hopped on there with me and I was like, oh, this is the life. You know, just for like 30 minutes, it was the yeah. life. And then I don't know if there was like chaos ensued after that. But yeah, it was lovely. The weather has been lovely. The downside here it's like everybody every place has their things it's like course, stunningly it's, beautiful here it's true and there's been fires so it's like hmm. pretty smoky some oh, days that's right too. so yeah yeah so that's been kind of weird. <laughs> it's been weird up here in the summers that didn't used to be the case but now it seems like yeah every summer there's a lot of smoke and is it fires. local or is it all coming all the way from quebec uh there's local fires really yeah, yeah. mm-hmm there was one actually we watched like from our backyard, like a, just across the river and we could see it like with our bare eyes. I don't know. Is that a word? But, but with our eye, just with our eyes, not binoculars, like wow. fire raging over on the mountain. That's so like, surreal. Wow. Oh. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Really crazy. So mm. we don't have to worry where we are, but. Yeah, yeah, it's just weird. Sister, what about you? Well, girl, I'm in the south. I'm so, more southern than you. We've had hot weather already. But, you know, it's like you just say goodbye to any pretense of coolness because, you know, <laughs> but what do you do? I mean, I've been talking about this for years. Everybody's like, all right, move beyond, move beyond it already. I'm like, we can't yeah. stop talking about yeah. it. Yeah. 
because it's summer. Mm -hmm. All right, dear friends, maybe we could jump in here. This is uh, all of it's been really good, and I hope it's been. We hope it's been a blessing to you. Uh, You know, many times we've never read papal documents in our own faith, and so maybe this is your first foray into a papal document. So I hope it's been a a great blessing for you, and perhaps it's been easier just to walk with us as we unpack it. So. As we dive in, Heather, what are some things that stuck out to you as we talk about this part three, which is the co-responsibility of the lay faithful in the church as mission? That's a mouthful. What do you think, girl? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the one thing that jumped out the most out of uh, everything I read was that it's everybody's responsibility to evangelize. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's often easy for us to go, oh, you know what they should do? (laughs) We're talking Mm -hmm. about somebody else. And I just feel like, yeah, the call call is for each of us individually to bring our unique gifts, our voice voice, the treasure of Christ that is in our hearts, that he's uniquely given himself to us and to share that with the world. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty huge call. Like, I mean, there's like, I just feel like in every chapter, every section, it's like, and it's also for you and you and you, and you need to do it here and here and here and here and here. And there's no separation uh, between our faith life and, and everything else that we encounter in the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah. How about you, Michelle? Yeah. I was thinking about it when I was reading the part, preparing for today and just reading this and just once again, the prophetic nature of John Paul II, that he has all of this wrapped up in John 15 and talking about abiding because you can get overwhelmed at all the different areas that we need, as he points out in this chapter, re-evangelization. Like, I mean, it's everything from the family to social electronics, the dignity of the person to science, to all the different things. And I mean, like even reading it, I was like, oh my gosh, oh my goodness, all these things that you can get overwhelmed. We have so much to do, but I love it that he roots it all in John 15 because it's not so much to do. It's how to be, it takes that posture of abiding. And I was just thinking about one of the quotes I have on my phone, like a screensaver is like Elizabeth of the Trinity. And it says, remain with me, not for a few moments, a few hours, which must pass away, but remain permanently, habitually remain in me, pray in me, adore in me, love in me. And I was like, that's John 15, remain in me. And with our root system so deep, that is where the new fruit, the new evangelization, the re-evangelization takes place. I think one of my favorite parts though, like to foreshadow about this chapter was the part of family about the part of family and society is such a main tool of re-evangelization mm-hmm. for our culture and really thinking deeply like how do people change a culture like really like what does that mm-hmm. look like yeah so I'm interested mm-hmm. to see where we take it today what about you sister I appreciate that he started off by talking about communion yep and communion and mission and mission doesn't come from any, you know, doesn't come from anything else other than communion. So he says in number 32, he says, at this point, communion begets communion. Essentially, it is likened to a mission on behalf of communion. And I was just thinking of, um, you know, Steubenville conferences this summer, the theme is refuge, where Jesus says, you know, come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you peace. And I was just looking through the theme development for that. And they were they were talking about how the questions every youth has. But I was like, I was thinking it's the question of every, the three questions of every person is, who am I? Where do I belong? And what am I to do with my life? And those are identity questions. Who am I and where do I belong? And then what am I to do with my life is the mission. And so just considering that of the communion, the mission comes from, if it's going to be real mission, not just kind of work or another program, it really has to come, like we've been saying, from communion. Mm -hmm. So he goes on to say, Mm -hmm. communion and mission are profoundly connected with each other. They interpenetrate and mutually imply each other to the point that communion represents the both the source and the fruit of mission. I'm just going to say that again. That was like mic drop. Communion represents both the source and the fruit of mission. Communion gives rise to mission and mission is accomplished in communion. And that reality of, of like you're saying, both of you are saying of abiding, which like we said, there's no substitute for that interior life, the interior communion with Christ, and then through our families and then through the church and then to the world, that continual source of communion is what gives rise to mission. And if we're, if we're and I think if we're on mission without communion, I think we have to really ask ourselves kind of what are, what's the deeper motivation there? Because otherwise it's going to be me trying to maybe grasp something for myself mm-hmm. and that like grab at a false communion versus allowing the mission to come from the communion. Yeah, that's beautiful. Along with that, there was this one quote that stuck out to me about that. And it says, communion with others is the most magnificent Mm. fruit that Mm. the branches can give. In fact, it's the gift of Christ and his spirit. And I'm like, that's just a good reference point is like, is? is the fruit that's coming from my life 
communion, both with God and with others. And it's talking about communion here, but as you're saying, sister, it flows from our communion with Christ first. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we are a lot about the doing and we forget about the being. And, mm -hmm. and that is essential, essential. I gave a talk the other night and as I was praying, I, was, I had 10 minutes. It was a 10 minute talk. So I was like, wow, Lord, what do you say in 10 minutes? You know, and I was just like rifling through all these subjects that I could, that I could talk about. And I just felt like Luke 10 just jumped out. There's need of only one mm -hmm. thing. And it's like from the Martha and Mary. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about what it was like for Mary to just sit at his feet like that. And I was like, she probably just didn't sit there idly. And he probably didn't sit there idly either. There was probably like this beautiful exchange of love where she was resting her head on his, on his leg. And he probably touched her hair. And, and I was mm -hmm. like, why would she ever want to leave? Mm -hmm. Like, why would she ever want to get up and help her sister when Jesus was like caressing her forehead, you know? And I was like, how often do I allow myself to really just be loved with his tenderness mm -hmm. and experience that union with him before I start bustling around with all the tasks that I have to do? So it's the constant, I don't want to say challenge because it's a beautiful invitation, a beautiful invitation from God. That's beautiful. And I love how he started this, the second part of this, like the hour has come for re-evangelization. And I like that, mm -hmm. just the title, the hour has come. This is a time set in history. The Lord just has me in this season, a deep dive. I think I may have said it last week on the podcast, but a deep dive into scripture again, where you have those seasons where you're just it's getting saturated with the word, but he has me in the Old Testament and Daniel and Esther and Nehemiah. But what struck me is in each of those books of the Bible, in the time of Daniel, in the time of Esther, in the time, that's how they all start out. Like there's a certain appointed mm -hmm. time and the, the Lord appoints mm -hmm. times and seasons for a reason and he appoints people in those times and seasons for a reason. The Lord is sovereign. There's nothing by accident. And so there's a time for re-evangelization and the time is now, you know? And I was thinking about like someone said something, we were talking in our the chancery here in our diocese, like Christendom is dead. And my bishop was like, ah, that's a little bit rough, you know, but it's true. Like Christendom is like, there's no longer, mm -hmm. like we're the first people in history that are a post-Christian society, like really. Mm -hmm. And we can look at it as a doomsday or we can look at it like, oh man, the time has come for evangelization. And I, someone was telling me, I was listening to a class about C.S. Lewis and he, they said, C.S. Lewis once described the difference between a man wooing a young maiden and a man winning a cynical divorcee back to marriage. Like there's a difference, like, you know, like there's a young bride where you're like, oh, marriage. And they're totally starry eyed and oh, my beloved. And then there's someone that's already been married and had their heart broken. And they're really cynical, like you can't get me. And I was thinking to myself, a majority of people that I know are the second. I was in the church. Mm -hmm. It didn't work for me. The Catholic church broke my heart. Da, 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 da. Like fill in the blank, whatever denomination, whatever thing. And I was like, so how do you woo them back to the bride? Like, that was my question. Like, what does it look like? The ones that have been hurt, the ones that were not fed, the ones that were not catechized, the ones that are not evangelized. How does the bridegroom woo them back to the bride? I don't have an answer to that question, by the way, but I was just, you know, I was like really discerning and thinking about that. Yeah. So what are your thoughts, sister? Yeah, those are, those are not easy answers. And I was just sitting in on a very long Zoom meeting yesterday, two and a half hours long Zoom meeting, hmm. hearing people that have power to make things happen, talk about these very things. And there are no easy no. answers. There is no trite, like fill in the blank. I mean, there, and that's why it's hard for us to wrestle with these things. I think it's difficult because there aren't any easy answers. And I appreciate in number 34, he says at this moment, so here's the hour, right? At this moment, the lay faithful in virtue of their participation in the prophetic mission of Christ are fully part of this work in the church of evangelization. Their responsibility in particular, he says, is to testify how the Christian faith constitutes the only fully mm. valid response to the problems and hopes that life poses to every person in society. And just imagine that if in our lives we were testifying every day, in many ways we are, but to intentionally testify, and not necessarily with our what we say, but how we live our life, that the Christian faith, that Christ himself, is the only fully valid response to the problems and hopes that life poses to every person in society. I mean, just imagine... 
I, I just think, you know, even in the last couple of months, we've just seen such an immense darkening of society. It feels like it just, it feels like such a, like a drop off a cliff and it's like, it's hard. Like those are hard things. So what are we supposed to do? And I think we can't run away. We can't run away and hide or bury our head in the sand either. But it's like Jesus, like what you both are saying, like, Jesus, what are you calling me for a time such as this of in my faith now in the vocation that I'm in and how am I supposed to be salt and light to the world? Cause it's not, we're not a waste. Like we're not just kind of here taking up space. Like there's a mission that comes from our communion, the communion of our baptism, like we talked about and our life of faith, our love of Jesus. And, those are real things, and these are not easy answers. There's no trite platitudes, but it's a life lived in the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's the Paschal mystery, mm-hmm. and that's the life Christ is inviting all of us into. Yeah, I think one thing I've been convicted by a lot is to not allow myself to move beyond the essentials. You know, sometimes, mm-hmm. we, like for myself, it's like, okay, so I I do feel the call as an evangelist to get out there and be like preaching to different people and finding new ways like to bring the gospel to people and, and help create environments for hearts to open to the, the real Jesus and who he mm-hmm. is. But at the same time, like, I would, it would be a miss for me to think I'm, I'm more mature than the basic gospel message mm-hmm. that I'm, oh gosh, I've matured yeah. past the essentials. You know, that is one of the biggest works in my life actually is, is to stay connected to the most basic, simple things. Because if we forget those, mm-hmm. what are we doing? You know, what yeah. <laughs> we become completely untethered because it is tied to what we just said, which is union with Christ. If that isn't the primary work in my heart, then, then what am I offering to people? Mm-hmm. Some good ideas, uh, some quippy comments, like who cares? You know, another mm-hmm. program, like that's not what the world needs. Like mm-hmm. the world needs people who are consumed by the love of God, who are able to bring that into the hurting places, into the darkness. Mm -hmm. They definitely don't need us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Jesus Mm -hmm. is who they Mm -hmm. need. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I love when he goes on to say, like in that part, the hour has come, he goes on to say to all people of today, I once again, repeat the impassioned cry with which I began my pastoral ministry. Do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. Open Mm -hmm. indeed, Mm -hmm. open wide the doors to Christ. But that just Mm hold that do not be afraid. And I was talking to my spiritual director and he was just telling me, Michelle, fear is a paralytic spirit. Like it paralyzes you. Fear and shame Mm -hmm. both paralyze you. They go together and they paralyze you. And thinking about the apostles in the upper room, they were scared before the Holy Spirit. How do we go from being scared and fearful to being bold and trusting? And it is the advocate. It is the Holy Spirit. It is relationship with that person of the Trinity. Because here we have the upper room. These people were hiding out, doors closed, windows, shades down, all the different Mm -hmm. things. And this amazing wind blew through, like open wide the doors. You know, it is the advocate. It is the comforter that will teach us all things and show us what we need to know. And I think now more than ever, it is then open and wide the doors to the Holy Spirit. Open Mm -hmm. wide the doors to let the winds blow. But what happens is, is I think the problem, not the problem, the challenge more so is when you open the wide, the doors, to the Holy Spirit, it does bring chaos. It shakes things up. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost like we rather the church go back to being a museum than a living garden because we don't want the chaos mm-hmm. in the in-between. You know, we don't want mm-hmm. just the mess and the dirt and all the things that come with a living garden. We rather things be more stoic than lively and organic, you know, and I think he's saying, okay, trust me with this. Oh, just open wide the doors. Do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. trust in the spirit Mm -hmm. trust where I'm going because the light and the darkness the darkness will not overcome it will not Mm -hmm. that's the promise you know sister what are your thoughts is that something like something that I think Jordan Peterson talks a lot about the the swing between I think chaos and tyranny yeah he talks about that like it's the pendulum swing of like total chaos and then total tyranny it's like it's the human kind of condition of of yeah it's like what what do you do and so it's like what is yeah like what is the holy spirit bringing us into that is beyond our power right beyond our control and the life that he wants to bring us into which is yeah many times we can't manage that and we want to yeah we want to manufacture that there was a we were at a retreat last week and uh, with dr bob and some people who were restoring the glory and uh one of the priests was sharing a story that somebody was asking him like, you know, Holy, you know, father, can you just ask the Holy spirit to do this? But, uh, I, but don't do that. Don't, don't, don't follow all these different things, but just ask the Holy spirit to do this. And he's like, look, I'll ask the Holy spirit, but man, you can't control the Holy spirit. Like you can't tell me what to tell the Holy spirit to do. He's like, cause I can't do that. Yeah. And, and it, I, so it's good. just, it's just true. And I, you know, one of the things that Bob was saying in that retreat was Dr. Bob Schutz was saying that the opposite of fear is not courage. The opposite of fear is communion. Mm. 
And I think that's, that's something that just really pierced my heart that week of like, that's so true. You know, it's not about being like, quote unquote, fearless, but it's like living, like we're said that living out of communion, which is offered to all of us. So when it talks, when it goes on to talk about the dignity of the person, the right to life and, and all those things come from communion because they come from God. Life comes from God and it's the gift that he gives. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, I appreciate, yeah, I keep saying that, but uh, the different aspects of the Holy Father is not shying away from that are difficult, but he is embracing them and inviting us to embrace them also. Yeah, it's interesting, like just the emphasis that GP2, I, I mean, love this from him, but it's the emphasis of the church. It's not just his voice is the dignity of the human person. And that's what he starts to get into next is just talking about the irrepeatability of every human mm. person and and that we can't just annihilate the person yeah. to come to, to just become part of a collective or an institution or structures or systems. And I think that that is a temptation, even within the church, you know, mm -hmm. that everybody would just conform. If everybody would just conform to this way and do like, like start acting like this, then we would all be better, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I just think like Jesus asks us to go places that he has already gone you know, he, he already reached out and touched the leper and he already drew close to the broken and the people who didn't have their lives together and, and weren't doing the right thing. And he reached out to all of those people that were on the periphery. And I, I just, I, I feel like accentuating the dignity of each human person and understanding that we're not just like trying to bring people into a system. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, friend. Yeah. We're trying to bring people into communion with, with one another and with Christ as well. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to bring, he goes on later in this chapter, say we, we come out of family. The more mm -hmm. that heaven comes to earth, earth looks like a family. Like that is what we meant. It's a communion of persons. And he goes on to say like in family, the lays faithful duty to society primarily begins in marriage and by family. We all came forth in the context of a family in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on a little bit further down to say, I loved this line. The family is the basic cell of society. It is the cradle of life and love, the place in which the individual is born and grows. But I love that line. It is the cradle of life and love. Where it is this warm place, like a cradle is a place where you rest and you learn mm -hmm. how to grow and love and learn in there. So I think, but one of the lines about family that I love is at the very end of the part, it says, one of the roles of family and its task of being the primary place of immunization for the person in society. Families teach us how to be human. You know, that's where we learn our humanity. And I like, like I said before in the podcast, I think last week, like this summer, my kids were doing human school, like, because we're, we're just noticing a couple of gaps in their formation. Like, okay, like these are parts that we need to learn how to be human, like mm -hmm. leisure and simple things like passing things at the dinner table, like just like practical mm -hmm. and like, what does it look like to be truly human? And I think he then goes and touches on either before or after this chapter um, about the part of science. Mm -hmm. There's beautiful and amazing things about science, but science also takes away parts of our humanity. And where we were looking at, I think one of the big things is our phone. I was just mm -hmm. amazed. I lost my phone. When, I thought I lost my phone when I was at the airport. And one of the guys said to me, like I had run back to the Delta Sky Club, whatever, to go see if it was there. And he's like, well, you got to go back. Your phone's your lifeline. And he said that to me. And I am I thought about it like I was, as I was racing across the airport to find my phone. I'm thinking, what am I going to do if I don't have it? I'm like, how in the world did I get this dependent on this little device? You know what I mean? I was Girl, like, mm -hmm. my phone is not my lifeline. Jesus is my lifeline. This is next up. You know, like, <laughs> da, 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 da. but then I was like, but dear Jesus, please help me find my phone. You know, but like, <laughs> that's just it. You know, like, so it is the school of humanity. Like that is a family and family can look mm -hmm. different ways and different places like family can be our friends. You guys are family to me, you know, like, because mm -hmm. we help each other be human in our truest form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's an important point because there's so many people that have experienced so much brokenness within their family that that doesn't sound like a very good thing exactly. that they want to engage in. And, and so to know that God is, you know, as I always quote this part in the catechism, there is no on, father like God is father. Go. And he makes up, he fills in every gap. That is not just an idea. That's a reality. And he will do that even through the gift of other people, through other families, through spiritual mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. And he will love us through community. Like it's in communion with others, uh, not in isolation. 
that we will experience life. So that that's incredibly important. And then, yes, <laughs> I think where we are with phones right now, we are on the brink of some massive change that will dehumanize us even more. Mm -hmm. So our commitment to this, I really believe has to be one of the top priorities. Even being families in isolation and not within a community is going to how do I say this without sounding like this is like alarming? I'm not meaning to say that, but I think community and living and engaging with other families, parish communities is going to be vitally mm -hmm. important. It always mm -hmm. has been, but I think it's going to be like a life, a literal lifeline to Jesus is going to be each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What both of you just shared right now is very powerful and it's very true and it's very beautiful. And I, I like this part on, on charity. It's really what he's talking about is charity and, uh, I know a, a dear priest friend of mine who prays every day that God would clothe him with humility and charity. And I was like, amen. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's, that God would clothe us with those things of love that, you know, wills the good of the other that is is in the, yeah, it's in the smallest interactions that we have day to day, which many times happen in our places of home, our places of community, our places of family, and that go outward. And yeah, that God would fill us with humility and charity. Like he would fill us with humanity and charity. That there's a quote that um, I mean we can kind of finish our our chapter here, but there's a quote earlier in the chapter that uh, Michelle you're reading from that it comes from the homily of John Paul II when he first became the Holy Father, and he that's where he's talking about you know do not be afraid. And he said oh, it's only God who knows the deepest recesses of our hearts. He, he said uh, too often people do not know what they carry inside in the deepest recesses of their soul and their heart. Too often people are uncertain about a sense of life on earth. Invaded by doubts, they are led to despair. Therefore, with humility and trust, I beg you and I implore you, allow Christ to speak to the person in you. Only he has the words of eternal life. Yes, eternal mm. life. And I was just thinking, amen. Like that he would, yeah, that he would speak to us, that he would make us human, like Jesus, make us more human. So that we don't live dehumanized ways, but we, that we recognize, like open our eyes, and I was thinking of even the, in Genesis and Hagar, the Hagar, you know, where Abraham and Sarah, mm -hmm. you know, disregard her. And, you know, Abraham has to put her out in the desert and she's dying and she puts her son away. You know, Ishmael, she puts him far away so she can't see him because she can't bear to watch him die. And then the Lord calls to her and it says, Genesis said, the Lord opened her eyes to see a well. He opened her eyes. And I was thinking like, Lord, open our eyes, open our eyes to see the truth, open our eyes to see each other, open our eyes to see the gift of one another, that we're in this together that we're in this together. We're a common family and he, that he would heal our wounds so we could be able to do that. So it's beautiful. Yeah. Any last words, my dear friends, as we kind of wrap up the section, anything else that stuck out to you? I liked at the, almost at the very end of this chapter of where, which I think is like a perfect ending. He says, it is a challenging program as a working ideal of particular and immediate urgency for the entire church, but in a specific way to the lay faithful in her. The good news of Christ continually renews the life and culture of fallen humanity. It combats or removes the error and evil which flows from the attraction of sin, which are a perpetual threat. She never ceases to purify and to elevate the morality of people. In this way, the church carries out her mission, and in the very act, she stimulates and makes her contribution to human and civic culture by her action, even in its liturgical forms. She leads people to interior freedom, mm. which I just love that part. The mm -hmm. church is a mother. She's going to lead us to freedom, and that the gates of hell will not prevail. And like we've echoed many a time, this is an invitation. Is a re-evangelization of a new evangelization. So that means also that we get to co-create with the Holy Spirit to have new initiatives, to evangelize in ways that we've never before. I really feel like on the forefront, it is going to be beauty. Like Bishop Barron often says, lead with beauty. Mm -hmm. I think we are going to lead with beauty because truth is such a hot topic. And I'm not saying don't talk about truth, but what I'm talking about is lead with beauty because beauty bypasses the brain and pierces the heart and then leads people to truth and goodness. And in my, my imagination, I'm like, that's exciting. Like that is exciting. Like this is pioneering. This is frontiering. Like we're on a new frontier. It's the re-evangelization of the church, but it is going to be remaining small, leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit. Like sister said, open our eyes to see what we don't see, Lord. Help us in the areas that we're blind. Let us see where you are and where you're moving and how we join in that movement. Miss Heather, anything you want to add? No, that's great. Mm -hmm. So we will continue, friends, we're going to jump into our one thing here in a second. We'll continue next week with part four, which is laborers in the Lord's vineyard, good stewards of God's varied grace, which we'll talk about 
being laborers. But uh, Michelle, you want to talk about your one thing for the week? Yes, my one thing is a book. Living the Seasons, A Simple Ways to Celebrate the Beauty of Your Faith Throughout the Year. Uh, My good friend Erica Campbell from Be a Heart Design wrote it, and it's um, you can pre-order it now, but I actually got to write an endorsement for this book. Mm -hmm. I only do endorsements few and far between these days because I have to really love the project, and I'm just also creating boundaries in my life, people. Um, Y'all can all applaud for me right there. Okay, anyway, Mm -hmm. but I love this book because it was everything we were talking about. Like, how do you bring celebrating the liturgy? Like Christentum used to be celebrated in the town square. Now it is not. So it is celebrated in our families. So she has such great ideas and it is visually beautiful. Just everything like how to throw a baby shower for Mary, you know, on different feast days. I mean, just really cute, creative ideas for kids of all ages, for families of all ages. You don't have to be married or single. Just really great ways to live out the liturgical year in a creative way. And so I love that. So I will post the link in the show notes. Heather, what about you? Well, my one thing, I may have mentioned this before, but we're just going to bring it back around again. It's called an uh, album called Live in the Prayer Room by Jeremy Riddle. I just mm-hmm. can't turn it off. Like it's been on since it came out and I just really love that album. Heather, every time I see him, I think of you. Uh, no lie. Like every time I see Jeremy, I know, I'm like, Heather, I know. Heather. Okay, I know. go ahead. There's like wow. a kindred spirit there, I think. But yeah, anyway, I really I really am appreciating that. Like there's a lot of music out there that's beautiful and it talks about a lot of different things, but there's something about pure worship of God that I just am really, really appreciating. So yeah, so live in the prayer room. That's my one thing. And I also my other one thing is just our staff, Christina and Camille and Kate. Yay, super grateful thank you. for them and all that they're doing mm-hmm. and just how they've brought their gifts to the table. They're just all lovely and I'm just so appreciative working with them. So really grateful for them. Sister, how about you? My, well, those were two lovely offerings, a book and um, some music. My one thing is food. Yeah. <laughs> my one thing for the week is um, overnight chia protein pudding which is actually very, very, very good. And so you can Is just, it? Are you lying? Come on. Tell oh, it's us. so is good. It true? I love it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's really <laughs> simple, really easy to make. And you can take it with you on your way to work or you can, yeah. So it's just a fun, it's like, a, it's cold too. So summer, it's a great summer, little breakfast that has all the things you want in it and all the things you don't want in it. So it can be whatever you want. So I'll put the recipe on and you can make it and have it tomorrow morning if you want to make it tonight. So there you go. All right, my dear friends, well, thank you so much for joining us. And until next week, we will be abiding together. Stay cool. We'll see you. All right, bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. If you liked it, would you please share it with a friend and leave us a review? We encourage you to head over to our website, abidingtogetherpodcast.com, where you can find all the show notes, links to our one things, group discussion questions for each episode, and beautiful coffee mugs, t-shirts, journals, and prints in our shop. There you can also subscribe to receive our weekly email with links to each new episode and all of the content. We'd love to connect on social media and invite you to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter so you can catch inspiring reflections every day. You're also welcome to join our private Facebook group and dive deeper into discussions with our fellow listeners. If the podcast has blessed you, would you prayerfully consider financially supporting us? The Body Together podcast is only available due to the generous support of our listeners. There are significant costs associated with creating this content, such as tech support, design, website, equipment, and hired staff that we need to be able to continue offering great content. Abiding Together is a nonprofit 501c3, and all donations are tax deductible. You can make donations of any amount through the Patreon website, or you can send us a check directly if that's easier for you. If you donate $15 or more per month on our Patreon page, you become a tribe member, and you will receive bonus content every month, such as recipes, music playlists, downloadable prints, and more. You can find all the information at patreon.com slash abidingtogetherpodcast. Thank you so much, and God bless you.